This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today we start a new journey through the book of Ruth. Everyone say Ruth. Ruth. And maybe we have some people who know someone who has the name of Ruth. Uh, do you know what that name means, anyone? Ruth? It means pleasantness. Pleasantness. And this uh, five-week journey we'll be on is entitled, Ruth, A Journey Through Loss, Loyalty, and Liberty for All. Everyone say loss. Everyone say loyalty. Everyone say liberty. Amen. And that's going to be our main theme throughout uh, the five-week journey as we study through the book of Ruth. For those, uh, how many of you have ever read the book of Ruth in your lifetime before? Okay, many of us, some of us, great. For those who have not read it, this is your opportunity for the next five weeks. We will read through and study through and be taught through the book of Ruth. And um, even if you have studied Ruth in a Bible study or at a Sunday school, open your heart to God's word. Because God's word is fresh. Amen? It's like fresh bread. Everyone, can you just imagine with me smelling fresh bread this morning? Oh, fresh bread from the bakery. And that's how the word of God is. Not only the Logos word of God, but when the spirit of God breathes life into the word of God, it becomes the rhema, living word of God. Everyone say rhema. The living word of God that speaks to our hearts, that gives us guidance, that gives us hope and encouragement. And I'm so excited to be able to share in this time with you. I believe God has a message for us this morning. If you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ruth chapter 1. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1 to 6 is our text for today. Ruth chapter 1. Verse 1 to 6 is our text for today. And for those who are uh, trying to find Ruth in your Bibles, it is the eighth book of the Old Testament. It is the eighth book of the Old Testament. And uh, it's right after Judges. Joshua judges Ruth. And it's, uh, it's a jewel. It's a jewel that many people miss out on. But we will not. For God has led us to this book. And we will study through it. Ruth, chapter 1. What does Ruth mean again? Pleasantness, pleasantness. Okay, pleasantness. All right. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1 to 6. If you have found it, please say Christ likeness. And if you have found it online as well, you can comment Christ likeness too. Please rise with me as I read God's word. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1 to 6. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Eli Melech, his wife's name Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Marlon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, uh, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Marlon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When she heard in Moab, Moab, that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may take a seat. Father God, I come before you in the mighty name of Jesus, asking your Holy Spirit to illuminate our hearts so that we may come under your word. We submit to the authority of your word. Holy Spirit, grant us, illuminate our hearts, grant us understanding, help us to receive the message you have for us. We honor you, even through loss, even through grief, even through suffering, for we believe that, God, you are working all around, and it's in the name of Jesus we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Ruth means pleasantness. That's the meaning of her name, and 
Uh, we will read through the book of Ruth in the next uh, five weeks. And today is going to be uh, a kind of a, an introduction, a background, uh, but also uh, there is a, a message for all of us. Today's message is entitled, Listen When God Seems Silent. Can you say that to your neighbor? Listen when God seems silent. And if you're taking notes, you can write that down as the title of today's message. Listen when God seems silent silent. I've mentioned that the book of Ruth is the eighth book of the Holy Bible. There are 66 books that consist of the Holy Bible. It's the eighth book of the Old Testament. And uh, Ruth is a very short book. And I would encourage you, perhaps you can read Ruth from chapter one to chapter four every day in your devotionals this week, and maybe for the next uh, five weeks, read through Ruth. Let the Holy Spirit teach you through the book of Ruth. It's four chapters, but if you count the verses, it's 85 verses in one book. 85 verses in one book. So if you want to be really proud and say, I, Pastor, I read a book of the Bible, <laughs> Ruth would be a good selection. 85 verses and you've completed the whole book. The 85 verses also consist of 45 conversations between people. And so today I want to set the stage up for who the main characters are for the book of Ruth. The main characters are three people. Uh, can you say with me, Ruth? Can you say with me, Naomi? Can you say with me, Boaz, uh, Ruth and, and Naomi uh, are both uh, widows, and Boaz is a farmer. Some of you may think, well, God only uses people like Moses and, and Joseph and, and David and Samuel and Paul and Peter and James. But did you know that all of these people that I've just mentioned, including Ruth, Naomi and Boaz, were normal people like you and me? Normal people like you and me. They didn't have any like extra hands or extra wings or extra legs that made them any more special than we are, just like you and me. They were people, humans living on this earth, but gripped by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why we want to learn from these people. Ruth is, is just a, a person who's actually not even an Israelite. She is a Gentile. She comes from the country of Moab. Perhaps you feel like an outsider too. Perhaps you're, an, you're a foreigner in this land. Maybe you've visited other countries and you've noticed how it feels so different to live in a country that uses a different language, that, that has different kinds of culture, the people look different than you. By God's grace, the United States of America is, is a very interesting one where we, we invite people from all over the world to, to make their living here. And God has blessed this land. Amen. And we want God to bless America. That's what I'm praying for. We need to be praying for the leadership of this nation so that this nation will serve God and honor God and glorify his name. So the stage is like this. We have three main characters, Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz. Uh, Naomi, her, her, name, uh, her name means, means this. Uh, excuse me. I, I need to back up a little bit. I'm getting too ahead of myself, okay? Uh, Naomi, her name means pleasantness. Everyone say pleasantness. Yeah, even as I was saying it, I'm like, there's something not right. Ruth means friendship and companion, okay? Ruth is friendship and companion. Naomi means pleasantness. Uh, Boaz, his name means uh in him there is strength. So, so there are three main characters. So let me uh, summarize it again for you. Uh, Naomi, her name means pleasantness. Ruth means friendship and companion. And Boaz, in him there is strength. In him there is strength. But there are also other characters. So I'm just going to run, run through uh, the first couple of verses with you uh, in story form because Ruth is indeed a story, a short story. Uh, let me run through it for you. So Elimelech is the husband of Naomi. And Elimelech means my God is king. So Elimelech and Naomi, they're a couple. They are married and they have two children. But they have two sons and the two sons are Marlon and Killian. Okay, Marlon and Killian. There is a famine 
where they live in Bethlehem. And Bethlehem in, in, in Hebrew, uh, it's two words put together. It's Beit and Lechem together. Beit Lechem. Beit means house in Hebrew and Lechem means bread. So Bethlehem means the house of bread. But don't you find it interesting that the Bible records that in Bethlehem there was a famine. So in other words, in the house of bread, there was no bread. In the house of bread, there was no bread. There was a famine in that land. And so Elimelech and Naomi and her two sons decide to go to a country where there is food, into a country called Moab. It's about a week's journey from Bethlehem, and they walk. It's about 100 miles approximately, and they, they journey on, onto this land, and they become uh, actually like immigrants. They move to a new location. I, I see a, a very interesting point here that Bethlehem, the house of bread, is going through a famine. Sometimes I observe what's going on around me and even the churches around us. Uh, some of them have uh, gone away from the gospel, from preaching God's word. And so if you're gathered as a church and if you don't preach the word of God, I believe that is Bethlehem in famine, which is the house of bread with no bread, right? The house of bread with no bread means that you are not preaching from the word of God. You are not learning from the truth of God's word. You can learn many good things, many good ideologies and many isms. But at the end of the day, what will last is the word of God. Heaven and earth will fade away, but the word of God will last forever. Amen. And so we need to be fed the word of God. And I am blessed to be a part of the church where I believe we can be the Bethlehem, Beit Lechem, the house of bread, where we can give living water and living bread to the people who are hungry and thirsty to know what is the meaning of life and why do I exist? And we need to give Jesus for he is the living bread. He is the light of the world. So we need to have a lot of bread in us. Amen. Don't, that doesn't mean overeat bread and overeat food. It means you need to overeat the word of God. You need to feast on the word of God, eat the meat of God's word, and you need to dig deep. And I'm so glad that there are couples in our church family that are reading the Bible together and praying together. God bless you, Chris and Joe. I hope you're watching today. They are reading and they are reading two chapters a day. And I would encourage any couple to read the Bible together and pray, any family to do that. There was no bread in the house of bread, Bethlehem. I connect that to the lack of the presence of the Holy Spirit in this day and age. The lack of the Holy Spirit. A.W. Toza says this. We don't welcome the Holy Spirit. Uh, let me quote him. Uh, A.W. Toza says this. If the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. Do you see what A.W. Toza is saying prophetically? That without the presence of the Holy Spirit, we will not prosper. We could kid ourselves and continue to live a life of religiosity. But we need his presence, his power. And that's why we as a church family, we welcome the presence of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us. My prayer for you and for me today is that we would be found not lacking with the life of Jesus Christ in our hearts and in our gatherings. I don't know what the main theme of conversations are between you and your neighbors and your family members. What do you talk about most? Do you talk about Corona? Do you talk about whatever's going on financially? Do you talk about struggles? Do you talk behind people's backs? By the way, you should not be doing that. That's sin. That's called gossip. Do you, what do you talk about? How about we talked more about the Word of God and talked about Jesus and we said, how has Jesus changed your life? And as we converse and as we lean into the Word of God, God will prosper us in our inner beings and that will show on the outside. 
the church has, has done something very, very dangerous where when people come to Jesus and, and sometimes we preach a gospel and make it so easy for them, we call that the truncated gospel. You cut the top off, you cut the bottom off, you only give them what they want to hear and they come to Jesus and you say, wow, that's great. Our church is growing. Our church is growing. And, and then you have people that continue to live a life that is not transformed by Jesus Christ, but they continue to live with the same habits. It's as if they serve two gods. They have two masters. No wonder the church of Jesus Christ has weakened. And people don't believe what we say. Because they know we don't mean what we say. Because we don't live out what we believe. But when we become the church of Jesus Christ together, and when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, and when we become, become people that are humble to God's guidance and teaching and healing and deliverance and anointing and unction, we will begin to live lives that are transformed. We will begin to speak words that are kind and gentle, encouraging, truthful, we will, will become people that, that will say things that have weight. Not a kind of people that just say frivolous things and after you've spoken for 30 minutes, you don't know what, what you're talking about. Even if it's one word, there is weight, there is gravity, there is power behind it because Holy Spirit is working through you. Now, we've established that the main characters, and there's also Orpah, which is another, uh, another uh, daughter-in-law of, of Naomi. Uh, but we, we want to see the main theme through this book. And I will give you the three words, which I've already uh, mentioned to you. Uh, God, in his faithfulness and providence through loss. Everyone say loss. Through loyalty and through liberty. Now, the underpinnings of loss, loyalty, and liberty is this. You, you need to understand three concepts, okay? There are three underpinnings of this story. The first underpinning is providence. Providence is, is where God provides. God's hand goes before. And so we, we need to understand that even if uh, God does not speak directly in this book, in this text, that he is still working. That's why the people of God do not use words such as luck or fate or by chance or happenstance. We don't use those words. Amen? For those who, who like to say good luck and, oh, I had some bad luck today, uh, I would encourage you to begin to catch yourself and don't say those words. Why? Because as a people of God, we believe in the providence of God. His hand goes forth, he goes forth, and he paves the way. Do you realize that God had to pave the way for you to be here today? Can I get an amen? Well, you thought, well, it's just me. You know, I woke up all by myself. I got dressed all by myself. I had breakfast all by myself. And I drove here and I got a ride here. And so it's all me. Well, let me ask you this question. Who gave you the breath this morning to be able to get up? God. Who gave you the vehicle so that you can get here? God. Who gave you the idea that I want to go worship with my church family today? God. And therefore, as believers in Jesus Christ, our language has to change. Like Alan was mentioning, our language, spirituality, we don't use words as luck. Oh, I had bad luck today. Really? Perhaps God put that in your way so that you would avoid an accident. Oh my goodness, I was on 128 and it was just so crowded and uh, I, I just hated it. I just had bad luck. Perhaps God knew that there was going to be an accident right in front of you. So he wanted to give you a detour around so you may have safe passage. Amen? So we don't use fate. We don't use luck. We don't use the word by chance. We use the word providence. Today, we have the providence of God giving you passage so that you may hear the word of God. And faith comes through hearing the word of God. Amen? And we are here 
because God has allowed us. And that's why I love to use this phrase. You and I have met today because God has given us a divine appointment. And that's the providence of God. Another underpinning that I want you to know, and it only comes three times throughout the book of Ruth in the 85 verses, is the word chesed. Everyone say chesed. I'm teaching you a lot of words today, and I, I don't expect you to remember all of them, but I would like you to write them down so that you can remember. This is the loving kindness of our God. And my, my daughter, Chesed Joy, her, her name, uh, we love that name as we were praying for her uh, as she was growing in her mother's womb. Lord, what kind of name do you want for her? And we searched the scriptures and we found Chesed, which is a word that I have loved uh, for many, many years because it shows the, the kindness of the Lord, the gentleness of the Lord, the loyalty of the Lord, the covenant love of God. It really cannot be explained in English. You just have to say Chesed, Chesed, Chesed the love of God, and we actually added uh, another English word to her first name, chesed, joy. So uh, we, we want her to live in the joy of the Lord, and the joy of the Lord will be her strength. And I pray for chesed, joy, every day, that she would be a joy to God, and that she would give that joy that she receives from God to many others. And the last word I want you to remember, which is the underpinning of the book of Ruth, is blessing blessing. We've been talking about blessing a lot in the past couple of weeks. God wants to bless you. Amen. It's not in the realm of your idea of blessing. You think, well, God can bless me um, just with money, a promotion, whatever health. My kids go to a good school. My kids get good grades. That's, that's a very fractional uh, portion of blessing. The main blessing God wants to give us is salvation. Everyone say salvation. He wants to give us new life, eternal life. Do you know that this world that we're living in right now is not our home? Do you realize that? That we are going towards heaven. We are heaven-bound people. And we want to take as many people with us to our eternal home with God. Because there are so many people that are going in the opposite direction, living in hopelessness, living in sin, living in transgression, living in pain, living in suffering. But we want to say, listen, I used to live that same kind of life, but I have found a way. For Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one, no one comes to the Father except through Jesus alone. And so we lead others to Jesus. And that's the true blessing. Even if you struggle through life, through poverty, through pain, and through suffering, remember this. If God has given you the grace to be blessed by him and his presence and his forgiveness, then we will be a blessed people for all eternity. I shudder to think about the people who live luxurious lives on this earth but have no way of getting into heaven because you cannot earn your way into heaven. You cannot buy your way into heaven. You cannot be good enough so that you can get to heaven. There is only one way that you come to Jesus, believe that he is Lord and Savior. There is no other way. God is asking you to give your life away so that Christ's life may abide in you. I was praying this week and, and the Lord revealed to me something that is uh, kind of embarrassing, but I want to share it with you because you're my church family. Can I do that? For some odd reason, something happened. And obviously, things happen with people, right? Things happen with people. And um, something happened and I, I got slightly offended. I was on the brink of either getting offended or um, just being okay with it. I was on that, that brink. I was on that tipping point. So what do I do? As many of us would do the same thing, we go to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, this, this, this happened. And I don't know why, because I love this person so much, but they choose to hurt me over and over and over again. Ha can anyone relate? <laughs> do you have kids? All right, okay. Uh, grandchildren? Uh, I, I love this person so much, and yet they choose to to disrespect and they choose to be passive aggressive and and so I was on that verge of getting uh, really offended and the Lord in the quietness of my soul 
on bended knee, he, he impressed upon my heart, uh, son, when's the last time you saw a corpse get offended? And I said, ah, Lord, a corpse does not get offended because the corpse is dead. And God didn't say anything more, but I could sense his smile on my face. Him saying, that's, that's right. Because God is inviting us to die to ourselves every day and live in the power of God's resurrecting power that raised Jesus from the dead. That I no longer live for myself, right? I, I don't live for myself anymore. So even if people close to me try to offend me, try to persecute me, try to say some obnoxious things against me, that's okay. That's okay. Why? Because I can embrace them with the love of God and I can pray for them. Remember the prayer request that I gave you a couple of weeks ago for your pastor, that I would have the Father's heart? If I can have the Father's heart towards those who are passive aggressive, those who continue to, to say things behind my back, and I continue to love them, God's love will change them. And even if it doesn't happen, I'm okay with that. Why? Because I did my part in loving them with the love of Jesus. Because what would happen if I got offended? I would lose my privilege of being able to pray for them, to shepherd them. By the way, uh, I can't pastor people that don't want to be pastored, by the way. But I can pastor people that come to me and ask me for counsel and say, Pastor, can you pray with me on this? So I would like you to understand that, that I am praying for you, but you need to also reach out. And my study is not the headmaster's office, as many of you guys think. It's a room where there is wise counsel and prayer and understanding and learning together. And so the Lord told me, <laughs> die. And I find the words that the Apostle Paul said, I die every day. So are you dead to your sins today? Dead to yourself? Are you living for Christ? That's my encouragement to all of us. So the underpinnings of Ruth uh, are three things. The providence of God, said love of God, and God's blessing. Now, the situation that Naomi finds herself in in the country of Moab uh, is, is a little bit, uh, I would say, uh, sad. Why? Because they have fled from Bethlehem to Moab, and she probably uh, was very much looking forward to a, a prosperous life. But she finds her husband, Elimelech, dies. So now she becomes a widow. Her two sons marry uh, Moabite women, Ruth and Orpah. But in the end, these two sons also die. Let's stop for a moment and grieve with Naomi. Naomi's name means pleasantness. There is nothing pleasant about her situation, is there? She finds herself without any husband, no husband, sons who could help her. And by the way, uh, widows back in those times and, and even today, uh, they are people that had no help no security, no stability, because the man of the house would go out and earn a living and, and whatnot and protect them. And, and even sons to carry on the, the lineage uh, of the family name. So she lost her husband, lost two sons, and she's left with two daughters-in-law who are also now widows. So she's sitting in her grief. She's sitting in loss. She's sitting in, in a place of uh, real... Um, uh, discouragement. She finds herself in a place of poverty, of loneliness. She finds herself in a place where her name pleasantness has worn off even. And later on we'll find Naomi saying to her friends back home, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara." which means bitterness. Have you found yourself in a similar situation? A loss of a loved one? A loss of a job? A loss of a relationship? Loss of finances? 
loss and pain, discouragement. Maybe a friend that you really trusted betrays you. Naomi finds herself in the middle of life. Life can be very tough. But in a biblical worldview, Naomi, her life portrays any person living on this planet. Let me say that again. Naomi's life and her situation right now in Ruth chapter 1 from verse 1 to verse 6 is a story that many of us can relate to. Why? Because life is hard. Life throws us things that we did not expect. A sudden loss of a loved one, a sudden loss of a job, a sudden loss of relationships, a sudden loss of a nation. I, I come from South Korea and, and my country um, has, has faced a loss of its own autonomy through many other uh, forces coming into our country and invading us. Can you even imagine the United States of America being invaded by foreign forces and they say, you can't use English anymore. You can't use Spanish anymore. You have to use a new language and it's an alien language. You can't use your names anymore. You can't be Alan. You can't be Jonelle. You have to have a different alien name. Can you imagine? You can't have the same laws anymore. You can't have the same liberty anymore. Can you even imagine that happening? You can't. But life would have it that there are people on this planet that live life in loss, destitution, people fleeing from their own nation because there is not only poverty but fighting and wars going on. So Naomi is a very good person who is a symbol of all of us. A symbol of all of us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your fresh wind. We pray that we would hold on to you through this, God. Naomi is a symbol of all of us walking on this planet. But there is something very important that we cannot miss or gloss over. And that is this. God, in his providence, provides for Naomi a blessed companion. Remember Ruth's name? Her name is Friendship and Companion. See, there were two daughters-in-law, one Orpah, one Ruth, and Naomi says, you all go back home. But Ruth stays with Naomi. Your God will be my God. And I will follow you as long as, as my God lives. Your God will be my God and I will follow you. And this companion does not leave Naomi. And I see the providence of God through Naomi, through Ruth becoming a companion to Naomi. Do you have that blessed companion in your life? And, and listen to me, Ruth, her, her name is companion, but do you know that Ruth is the ancestor of David, do you know that David, the king of Israel, the king, the greatest king that Israel ever knew, that Ruth is the great grandmother of David, and that through the lineage of Ruth and Boaz comes Jesus Christ, the Messiah? Do you see that God wants to be your companion today through the life that you're going through, even if it is bitter and suffering and pain and loss comes to us? The providence of God holds us with his hesed loving kindness, and he will bless us into a destiny. Do you see the companionship of God? Do you see the covenant love of God? Do you see that you are in the center of God's will as you obey and surrender to his ways? Just like for Naomi, there was Ruth. And for us, we have Jesus. Amen. Do you have Jesus in your heart? Do you love him? Do you obey him? Because Jesus is our blessed companion. So I see that Ruth becomes a person that symbolizes the companionship of God's covenantal love. 
A love that will never forsake us nor leave us. A love that is true and pure. A love that is not in it to get something out of me. But a love that wants to thrust me into Christ likeness. A love that wants to help me towards becoming a better version of me to the original design because I believe I am created and you are created in God's image. But sin came in the way. Sin came in the way, so Jesus had to come and to wash our sins away by his death on the cross and by his resurrection. We live a new life. We have become a new creation. Hallelujah! And that's why I no no longer live for myself, but I live for the message and the beauty and for the glory of God. Are you encountering that God every day of your life? Are you meeting with him? By praying by the word? Are you, are you coming to him? Are you sharing him? Are you living filled with the spirit of God? Or are you living in the brokenness, sitting in your own pain, feeling sorry for yourself? Brothers and sisters, let me tell you, just as Ruth became the companion for Naomi, Jesus wants to become a companion and friend to you. He wants to be the Lord of your life, the master of your life to help you along. And Jesus has sent us the advocate, the Holy Spirit, that we do not walk through life alone. Yes, we might have trouble. Correction. We will have trouble. Jesus said it. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, Jesus says, for I have overcome the world. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. So no matter the pain, no matter the loss, no matter the the disappointment, Jesus wants to pour out his love and kindness and gentleness on your heart so that you may see God for who he is. You might think, well, it's because of my lack of faith that not this isn't happening, that's not happening. Well, maybe there's some truth to that. Because somehow we have developed a mindset in our own churches that every time you pray, it must happen. God, help me to win the lottery, and then you win the lottery. You know, you you think that's a blessing from God. I'm of the persuasion that God would not answer that prayer for you because you do not know how to handle ten dollars so how would you handle ten million dollars you don't know how to tithe from the ten dollar check that you give you don't know how to be generous to God so why would God give you a hundred dollars Jesus says be faithful with little and I will give you much the blessings of God are not determined by how comfortable you are Can I say that again? The blessings of God are not defined by how comfortable and how luxuriously you live. The blessings of God is that he is with us through thick and through thin. Day in and day out. 24-7, 365. That God is Emmanuel. God with us. Jesus, his name is Emmanuel out of many. God with us. That he is for us. That he is with us. That he guides us. And by the way, Jesus is coming back soon. So if you're investing on this earth and not investing in heaven, your reward in heaven will not be a mansion. People have said, well, if we get to heaven, we're all going to live in mansions, right? No, you won't. You'll be rewarded to what you have done and sold in the kingdom of God. That's why I love Alan's testimony that he attended a church for 10, 15 years, but he didn't give a dime. Nobody taught him how to tithe. Nobody challenged him that money cannot become our God. But by the grace of God, God softened Alan's heart. And I'm not preaching this to you so that you give more because God doesn't need your money. God wants your heart. But why we give is in in response to the grace and loving kindness we have received. So again, remember this point. Life is going to be hard. Don't blame God for it. He will make things right in due time. Amen? 
I read in Genesis 50 verse 20 that Joseph says this, and I'm paraphrasing. The evil one meant this for evil, but God had, has turned this around so that there'll be the saving of many lives. That's the kind of God I serve. What kind of God do you serve? And if your prayers are only for yourself and your children, bless my business, bless my job, just bless me. And if your prayer is only for your own church, then you are limiting God's power. We need to be praying for the nations. We need to be praying for Afghanistan. We need to be praying for the Middle East, for China, and for North Korea, that, that the Lord will uphold the church of Jesus Christ and give courage to those who are being persecuted right now for the name of Jesus. That's the kind of prayer and expanse that God wants us to have. I have a vision. Do you know that? Don't think of yourselves, oh, we're just this little church in Danvers, Massachusetts. I see a greater vision that we will have global domination by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Global domination as we make disciples and send them out to the nations. I see it with my eyes of faith. You need to see it too. Open your eyes. When you start focusing on yourself and my problems, oh, woe is me. This didn't happen. This promotion didn't happen. That didn't happen. Oh, I didn't get this bonus when my next person in my cubicle, they got a bonus. And stop it. I, I give you the best counseling, by the way. Just stop sinning. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Look to God and look to the companionship God is giving you. And as we study Ruth and her character, her faithfulness in following the will of God, we will see God's mighty hand and blessing be poured out upon this family that had no hope. Through the story of Ruth, we must recognize the providence of God. Providence that's defined by, uh, by Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible. God's activity throughout history in providing for the needs of human beings, especially those who follow him in faith. Do you know that God is the one who gives you the air to breathe and gives you food to eat and has given you your jobs, your livelihood, your health, the, you know, your ideas, your intellect, your logic, everything. God has given you those things. So let me ask you this question. You breathe in God's air, you eat God's food, you live under the grace of God, and how are you living your lives for the glory of God? You receive all the blessings and the benefits of the kindness and the love of God. How are you using that for God's glory and fame? Brothers and sisters, we need to wake up. We need to wake up to the truth that God has given us so much of his resources, but we are hoarding his resources and not giving out to a world that needs him desperately. We cannot, we cannot forget the providence of God in our lives. His provision, his guidance. The word providence and the word provision uh, comes uh, from Genesis uh, where uh, Abraham is, is uh, commanded by God to sacrifice his son Isaac. But at that moment of him getting that knife to kill and slaughter his son, God says, stop. And he sees a ram in, uh, caught uh, in the thicket. And, and he says, Jehovah Jireh, God my provider. See, in the 85 verses of Ruth, God does not speak to Ruth and says, when you go to Bethlehem, you're going to meet someone and he's going to take care of you and you're going to be the great grand grandmother of David, the greatest king that Israel has ever known, and you're going to be in the heritage of Jesus Christ the Messiah. God does not talk to Ruth like that. God doesn't even talk through the prophets to Ruth or to Naomi like that. What 
Ruth and Naomi do is they continue to follow faithfully each step of the way in following God's plan, even without knowing the result. And that's what we call faith. Some of us want to know what's going to happen next. Well, if God's going to bless me, I'll give to the church. I'd rather you not give to the church. You have that kind of mindset. The mindset ought to be, I trust the word of God to be absolute truth, so I obey it. And Ruth and Naomi and Boaz, every step of the way, followed God's hand that was leading them through events, through situations, even through loss and pain and poverty. God provides, God provides, God provides. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Is God your provider today or do you think you are providing for yourself? Well, I, you know, I've got the brains to get this job, so I, it's all glory to me. All honor and glory to me. And you wouldn't say that out loud, but that's the way you live, don't you? We must get rid of that pride that binds us, that shackles us back. And we must live in the liberty God has for us as we recognize God as king, as ruler, as a loving father. There's one thing I want you to notice from Ruth. Uh, again, uh, this is an application I want you to take away. Ruth uh, chapter 1 verse 6. Uh, please uh, meet me there. This is Naomi. In the moment of loss, what does Naomi do? And I think this is going to be helpful for you. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to turn home from there. Everyone say, when she heard. When she heard. The Hebrew of when she heard here, listen, is Shema. Okay, Shema. And we need to understand this as we apply this word in our lives now, today. Even though Naomi was going through such pain, such loss. Can you see from today's text that her ears were open to the works of God? Can you see that even through pain and suffering and poverty, Naomi's ears are still open to God stories, to the works of God, of what God is doing in the midst. For she heard that God had come to the aid of the people in her homeland. And from that place of hearing God, why? Because faith comes through hearing the word of God and because the, God's sheep knows the shepherd's voice in John 10. Naomi's ears were open to the frequency of what God is doing. And God is working all around us. We just sang it today. Even though I don't see it, he's still working. Even though I don't feel it, he's still working. So Naomi in the place of brokenness, maybe in tears, maybe in grief. Yes, okay, we can understand that. Absolutely. Those are legitimate emotions. But even in that place of brokenness, our ears have, have to be attentive to what God is doing. What God is doing. What God is doing. What God has done. Do you know that there is a massive revival happening all across Africa right now? You don't hear that on the news though. But there are people coming to Jesus being filled with the Holy Ghost. And there are churches being planted all over Bangladesh. The last time I heard, even through our own denomination, 3,000 churches being birthed in, in the country of Bangladesh. Hallelujah! you got to hear what God is doing. And from that place of hearing God, that's when we move. See, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepare themselves to move. I wonder if you're making decisions in your life, very important ones. Don't move until you hear from God. That's my recommendation. That's my encouragement to you. You're about to purchase something big. Don't move. Don't make that purchase until you hear from God, until God gives you peace and says, absolutely, my daughter. 
because there are many times we make decisions on our own. We jump into relationships that God did not approve of. And what do we find ourselves doing? Grieving, in pain, being abused. And I believe God can redeem all of that. But now you have heard the application from Naomi in the most deepest, darkest pit of destitution, of discouragement and discomfort. Her ears are still tuned in to the works of God. Are your ears tuned in to the works of God today? Or are you listening more to the news, the tabloids, the media? Listen, YouTube, although there are many good things like my sermons online and many other good pastors who preach online. It's not the whole truth. What do you give your ear to? What do you give your heart to? What do you give your eyes to? Think about this. Deeply. Whatever you feel an intake, there's going to be an output. And if, you, if your intake is bad stuff, your output will be bad stuff. Can I get an amen? So we need to take in the good stuff, the organic gospel, nothing more, nothing less, only the truth of God's word with the power of the Holy Spirit and let the word speak to us and you hear what God is doing throughout the ages. He has been faithful. He is our covenantal God. He loves us and he has a better, better way for us to go. He wants to revive us. He wants to restore us. He wants to redeem us. He wants to release us into a new destiny that we can be used for his kingdom glory. Am I the only one excited here? Hallelujah. God is faithful. And so we put in ourselves the good things of God. And then we'll find ourselves bearing fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. The fruit of the Spirit will grow in the gifts of the Spirit. Amen that you lay hands on people and they get well in Jesus' name, that you move in miracles, signs and wonders, amen, not being proud of yourself, but giving glory to Jesus only. Wherever you go, you prosper. At the workplace, your boss says, I don't know what's going on, but whatever you do, it comes out great. And what do you say? It's because of Jesus. I got to brag on my wife a little bit. Uh, my wife, uh, she's, she's a doctoral student. And she's studying uh, psychology, um, counseling psychology. And um, one of the supervisors, when she said, I need to take a day off for my ninth anniversary camping trip, uh, the, the, the uh, supervisor said, it's your ninth anniversary with one person? She said, yes. Well, in nine years, I know many people who go through a couple of different husbands. And how, how did you make that work? Obviously, the supervisor is a pre-believer. We're working on him. Amen. Uh, how did you make that work? And, and what did Sarah say? Sarah said, well, we are a couple and a family that has our principles based on the word of God. Hallelujah. And I believe that's a testimony to that supervisor. It'll make him think, hmm. What does that mean to base a relationship principled on the word of God? And if the supervisor needs a Bible, who's going to give it to him? Sarah. Maybe there'll be more questions that come up and she will have an answer because Holy Spirit will use Sarah so that that person can come into a relationship with Jesus and him and his whole household are going to be saved by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't try to do something extravagant for the Lord. Live your life in the fruitfulness of the gospel. Live every day for him. Naomi does a good thing. She opens her ears to what God is doing. And when she hears of what God is doing, she moves to that place where God is working. From the place of loss, she moves to the place where there is flourishing, where there is blessing, and she puts herself in that position. And from that place, 
what happens. God opens doors for Naomi and for Ruth to be fed, to meet Boaz. And in the end, Ruth and Boaz are able to come into holy matrimony. Boaz being the kinsman redeemer. We'll get into that in a couple of weeks. And then Ruth is able to be that channel of blessing. Not because she saw all these signs and wonders, but because she was faithful to the chesed, covenantal love of God, and she obeyed every step of the way. So who are you going to give your ear to today? Will you give your ear to the God who loves you, who is passionately in love with you? Will you give your life to him? Will you say yes to him? Throw away your own version of Christianity. Even throw away the heritage of whatever, how many decades of Christianity your family has been living in. It's your individual faith today, right now. It doesn't matter if your father's a pastor or a missionary. It doesn't matter if you've come from a family that doesn't know God. Today, your individual relationship with Jesus counts for he wants to be the blessed companion of your life. He will wipe away all tears when he comes back, but he will comfort you by the Spirit of God, by the Word of God, by the truth, and he will set us free into liberty. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for the freedom I have found in you. Where would I be if Jesus hadn't found me? And if I hadn't opened my heart to him, I'd probably be dead in my sins or locked up in a prison somewhere because I could not control myself. I could not free myself. I was living deeply in sin, in transgression, in rebellion to his name. But the kindness of God, the chesed love of God, gripped a sinner like me and forgave me and plunged me into his blood and washed me clean and gave me a new identity, gave me a new name, gave me a new destiny, and has released me to proclaim the gospel for Jesus. Hallelujah. And has given me a vision for global domination with the word of God, hallelujah, not by my, not by strength, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. God is alive and well. We must give our all to him. No turning back. No turning back. Sing with me. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, though none go with me. Still I will fall. Rise to your feet and sing. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. No to the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind. Rise to your feet and sing. The cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me. No. Turning back, no turning back. Close your eyes, raise your hands to heaven this morning. Father God, we surrender to you all of our fears, all of our worries, all anxiety. For we believe in the providence of our God who goes before us, 
who is our front God, who is our rear God, who is the one who can open up the Red Sea so that the Israelites can walk through on dry land, the God who can open up the Jordan as they walk in faith every step of the way. Father, we want to be a people of God that live under the truth of the providence of God and not live our own way. Teach us your ways, O Lord. Forgive us for thinking that we are any better than you. Forgive us for comparing ourselves with other people. O Lord, humble us so that we may receive your word, your truth, that we may be full of the bread of life, full of the living waters. For those who have faith in me, from their inmost being, their bellies will flow out streams of living water, Jesus said. So I'm praying right now for your holy unction to captivate each heart, each mind, each person tuning in on the live stream. I'm praying, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, that today, from this day forward, we would embrace our blessed companion, Jesus Christ, and our blessed companion, Holy Spirit, and our blessed companion, our Father God, three in one, perfect in unity and harmony, that we would walk with you, that we would no longer live for ourselves. I'm praying, God, that you would give us eyes to see eternity, that we would know the times we are living in, that Jesus is coming back soon. So Lord, we give ourselves to you for your cause, for your kingdom. I'm praying that from this place, revival will break out. Revival does not need marketing. A fire of the Holy Spirit does not need marketing. People will flock to the truth of God's word. And I'm praying in Jesus' name that you would not only prosper us, but all of our surrounding churches, all around this nation and all over the world, that everywhere the gospel of Jesus is preached, there will be revival, a breakout, an awakening that God is alive and well, a God of love who keeps his promises. So, Lord, we honor you. We give you praise and honor. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.